per book, uh, published uh, with the American Mathematical Society. So, uh, <laughs> um, all right, I'll hand things over for today's talks uh, on fully augmented links, generalizations, and applications. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for uh, coming along. So again, my plan is to give three 15 minutes-ish long talks, um, and then uh, some breaks for questions in between. And I'm gonna try and, and uh, keep today's lectures, the three of them relatively uh, self-contained, meaning they'll, they'll build upon each other, but not so much upon yesterday. There will be some hints for tomorrow as well, but um, we'll, I'll try and keep them boxed in. So just, just a reminder though, to those who were here yesterday, we were looking at alternating knots and uh, the fact that they are highly geometric. So they have some really nice hyperbolic geometric properties. But the way that we prove these is we looked at embedded surfaces in the complements and uh, we use the combinatorics of the diagram in order to rule out particular surfaces. So today I wanna to talk about um, my, uh, my other favorite class of um, geometric links. These are called fully augmented links and the geometry for these links follows directly from geometry. So these are really quite constructive. And uh, I had somebody once describe them as a hands-on hyperbolic geometry. So we're going to do some hyperbolic geometry today. So let me start by defining this, this class of links. And we'll again, we'll talk about some applications of them later. But just for now, um, for some uh, doing some geometry. Uh, this is a picture of a fully augmented link. Um, in general, fully augmented links have two types of link components. So they have the knot strands, and these lie on the projection plane. Oh, I'm not sure what happened with my pen there. OK, so uh, this is an example of one of the, the knot strands. It's just on the projection plane. And then these crossing circles are these little unknotted circles. So they always bound a, uh, a two punctured disk. where this disc is punctured by strands of the knot coming in. Uh, and, you, and you think of them as perpendicular to the projection plane. Okay, so that's a picture. And the first thing to notice is that these links have a symmetry. So there's a reflection uh, in, the, in the plane of projection that will take the link back to itself. So you fix the plane of projection and you just reflect in, in the screen. Uh, and if this link happens to be hyperbolic, then the fact that there is this reflection in the plane of projection implies that all of the surfaces on this plane of projection will be totally geodesic. So if, we'll have to come back to that. But so for example, this, there's a, a, a disc here that's punctured. Uh, it's a twice punctured disc again. This is going to be totally geodesic. But so is this, this bigger disc and this outside disc. Basically, every surface on the projection plane will be totally geodesic if this happens to be hyperbolic. Uh, that follows from the um, basically the proof of Mostow Prasad rigidity, which says you can you can straighten this reflection to be an isometry in the case that you have a uh, hyperbolic structure. But then we've also got these two punctured disks that are bounded by crossing circles, and these are also going to be totally geodesic surfaces. And this just follows from um, basic hyperbolic geometry calculations. Uh, there's a there's a paper by um, Adams from the 1980s that proves that. Okay, so this is nice. Okay, so, so we've got these two sets of things that are going to be geodesic. So we're gonna cut along those and we're gonna turn this into a totally geodesic polyhedron. Or it, at first it's gonna be combinatorial, then we'll deal with the geometry in a minute. So decomposition into ideal polyhedron, three main steps. The first step is you cut it in half. So just slice the projection plane and this yields, um, it actually yields uh, two, um, two halves. So I've only drawn the top half here. There's a, a, a half on the bottom that's just the same thing only reflected. So because these are identical up to reflection, I'm only ever going to draw one of them. Okay, so um, these are right identical. The, the next step is we take these little, now they're sliced two puncture discs, so the middle of these um, half two punctured disks, and we slice them up like a bit of like, like pita bread. So you slice up through the middle of the disk, right? So here's, here's this half disk, slice it up. 
uh, like like so, and then open it out. So I've I've shown what this is what this looks like here in this picture. You take this this half, you slice it open like a pita bread, and then you flatten it out onto the the plane. Okay. And then finally, we are looking at the complement of this link, which means that these little remnants of, of link strands, these should not be part of the picture. So we're going to collapse them to ideal vertices. So in other words, vertices that, that, that don't belong. So this um, piece of pita bread becomes a bow tie. All right, so uh, when we're all done, we get a lot of bow ties. So let me just go through this um, example for this particular link. So the step one was to cut it in half. Maybe I, I won't worry about that, but um, if we have, I'm going to label this A, B, C, and D here. And basically the instructions are for each one of these um, crossing circles, you cut it in half and you uh, open it up and then you, you shrink the ideal vertices and it gives you these bow ties. So we're going to have bow ties named A, B, C, and D. And the bow ties are connected just the way the link is connected. So there are strands here and here. Uh, there's one between D and the bottom of A, A and C. All right, so I'm just redrawing the picture of the diagram, only basically I'm just replacing um, the crossing circles with these with bow ties. Okay, and then finally I shrink the strands down to be ideal vertices. So like this bit of knot here gets collapsed down to that, that vertex. We have this bit of knot here also gets collapsed down to this vertex and so on. I've already collapsed the um, these central guys to 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 vertices, uh, but notice as well. So we have two different types of vertices. Uh, the, they're the ones that come from the knot strands, but then also between these these bits of bow tie with the same label, you have a, a, a vertex that came from a crossing circle. So the vertices come from crossing circles and from knot strands. Okay, we're gonna turn this into something hyperbolic. So let me again review a little bit of hyperbolic geometry. So I said this yesterday, but uh, I wanna say a little bit more today and also in the interest, in, or in the interest of keeping this somewhat self-contained, I'll just review. Remember, we're looking at the upper half space model today. So this is, you can think of as H3, um, is uh, the complex plane across uh, positive real numbers. And the metric again, maybe let me just remind you, it's a rescaled Euclidean metric where you rescale by the height. Okay, today we're gonna talk about geodesic planes. So I told you that if these augmented links are hyperbolic, then they have all of these um, geodesic surfaces within them. When we lift to the universal cover, which is going to be hyperbolic three space, these geodesic bits will lift to geodesic planes. And the geodesic planes, I've, I've drawn some here, but basically they are hemispheres. So something that looks like this, but also um, vertical planes. So their, their boundary at infinity is either a line or a circle um, on um, this extended, uh, complex plane is the boundary at infinity of, of hyperbolic three space, okay? So we need to know what the isometries are as well. I didn't mention this yesterday, but the isometry group, um, at least the orientation preserving isometries uh, is the group of uh, PSL2C. So these are two by two matrices. The entries are in C, we have determinant one. So AD minus BC equals one. And uh, we don't care up to plus or minus, we get the same element and that's what the P for projective is for. And these act on the, the boundary just by your standard Mobius transformation from complex analysis. Right, so uh, A applied to, to Z, you get AZ plus B over CZ plus D. And a key point of, um, that you, again, that you would learn in like from studying these in a, say a complex analysis class is that these isometries, these elements of PSL2C, they take circles and lines to circles and lines. Uh, these are in the extended complex plane, I should say. Okay, so this is kind of critical. So let me go through um, an example of how you, how you would map circles and lines to circles and lines. So over here on the left, I've got a picture of a collection of circles. And I'm gonna take this particular point here. Uh, 
I don't know, maybe we, that's zero. We're going to take zero to the point at infinity in by some sort of a Mobius transformation. I don't actually need to write it down in order to see what happens to the geometry. So notice that because I have these two circles, like so, that are running through that point zero, when I take this point zero to infinity, those two circles become parallel. So they parallel lines, they're now tangent at infinity. And so that's what this parallel um, thing looks like. Uh, similarly, they're both tangent to this other, these, other, these two other circles. So if I, I give those numbers, that, that means these two other circles will go to points, uh, will, will go to these circles here. So one of them will be one, one will be two, you can swap the orientation and flip them, but that, it's, that's okay. Uh, and then finally, we've got these dotted circles that are going through um, this tangent point as well. And these are going to be, because they're tangent to each other, uh, they become parallel lines, but they intersect these other two circles at right angles. And so in fact, we get um, perpendicular lines going through like so, okay? So that's what uh, happens if we take a, a point on this collection of circles to infinity under one of these Mobius transformations. And then I've got I've drawn a similar picture over here where now this time one and two happen to be tangent all, already. They, they get squished together here, but maybe I won't go through that. All right, so we've got this. This is now a combinatorial ideal polyhedron that I constructed from my, my fully augmented link. So going back to that, this is from the fully augmented link. Um, associated to each of these polyhedra, we get a triangulation of the projection plane. So I've got to go through this for you. But maybe let me back up a bit before I um, before you read ahead in the slide. Uh, remember that all of these um, these white regions came from regions in the plane of projection. And so if this is hyperbolic, then each of these regions is going to be totally geodesic. Okay, so this is supposed to be totally geodesic. And if it is totally geodesic, then that means when you lift to a hyperbolic structure, so if this has a hyperbolic structure, I should say, then the universal cover will be hyperbolic three space. And a lift of a totally geodesic surface will be a, um, a hemisphere, okay? So if I have this uh, 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 totally geodesic surface, then I can lift and get a hemisphere. But then notice this is supposed to be, this is going to be tangent at this ideal vertex to another one, which is going to be tangent. These both will be tangent to another one, and so on and so on. And so what we're really, if this is hyperbolic, then we would see a collection of hemispheres on the universal cover, which means that on the boundary of the universal cover, we would be seeing a collection of um, circles on the uh, on, on the uh, extended plane. Okay, um, so uh, this this leads us to what is called a, a circle packing. So a, a circle packing is a collection of disjoint disks. They've got their centers all at vertices of a graph and their tangent and edges of a graph. Or the graph is called the nerve of the circle packing. Uh, let me show you what the nerve, so we would have a nerve of a circle packing coming from this picture. Maybe let me switch colors. So we're going to have a vertex for each of these white faces because these are supposed to be totally geodesic surfaces. And they're going to be tangent across these ideal vertices. So I end up with, uh, I put edges, sorry, edges through each of the vert vertices like so. And you'll notice that every one of them will completely enclose one of these triangles in our bow tie regions. And that's going to imply that this is a triangulation of the sphere, in fact. So my nerve is a triangulation of the sphere. Triangulation of this uh, Riemann sphere is the extended complex plane. And then I also have these special, um, remember some of these correspond to crossing circles. So the X's where we have the uh, crossing circles meeting are between the, the, the center of each bow tie. This gives you a dimer. So a dimer is a choice of one edge meeting every triangle in this triangulation. And we pick one up naturally from this decomposition, okay? just by putting X's on the edges that correspond to the crossing circles. All right, this is where we get to use some fun machinery. So the Kobe-Andreyev-Thurston theorem, also called the circle packing theorem, 
tells you that if you have a connected simple graph on the two sphere, then there is a circle packing whose nerve is G. And in particular, if you have a triangulation, the packing is going to be unique up to the action of PSL2C. Uh, this was proven, I think, by Kobe in the 1930s, but uh, both Thurston and Andreev were not aware of this when they um, when it was reproven in the, in the 70s, I believe. So in any case, we had this, this triangulation, this nerve of, of this thing over here. So uh, I mean, basically, you can draw what the circle packing is going to look like. There's going, there are going to be uh, four circles. There's a circle on the outside, and then there are going to be four going around the sides, and one in the middle. And uh, my circles aren't particularly circular, but I luckily redrew the picture where I took one of the vertices to infinity. Uh, and these are actual circles and lines, and this is what the diagram looks like for this particular figure. Okay. Okay. Once I have this circle packing, I can think of this as sitting inside of hyperbolic three space, and each of these corresponds to a uh, totally geodesic plane, uh, including the we have these vertical planes. We also have these. I've been ignoring the A, B, C, D. Those become these interstitial regions here. And so there are these triangular regions. Again, there's going to be a unique circle going through each of these. OK, so we get this circle packing, and then we get these dual circles. And if we remove, there are actually also dual circles here. Oh, that's, I didn't draw those very well. Anyway, if we remove all of the half planes bounded by these things from the picture, we get an ideal polyhedron. And it's this totally geodesic thing in hyperbolic three space. So this ideal polyhedron gets this geometry that's completely determined by the geometry of the circle packing. And then we can use this, we undo our gluing, we glue white faces to white faces, we fold along these bow ties, and that will give us a hyperbolic structure on the fully augmented link. So uh, the fully augmented link, this has a hyperbolic structure, which is completely determined by the circle packing. And Mostow Prasad rigidity now tells us that because we have found a hyperbolic structure, we have found the unique hyperbolic structure. And this manifold must indeed be hyperbolic because there it is. All right. Uh, and there's a converse to this. If you give me any circle packing and a dimer, then you can take this, this um, circle packing and you can turn it into an ideal polyhedron. You fold across the, the dimer, these tell you where your crossing circles are, and you reflect in the white faces, and that gives you a fully augmented link. Okay. Uh, super quickly, um, when we are looking, so we're the geometry of cusps, this refers to um, the view from a pointed from a pointed infinity. So in particular, this slide shows a picture of what what happens if you look at the geometry standing inside of this uh, this this torus that corresponds to a neighborhood of this thing. So this will be a cusp neighborhood. In the polyhedron, it's this point here. In the circle packing, if you take that particular point to infinity, you'll get a collection of circles that looks like this. But recall there's a reflection. So there are two of these polyhedra. There's a reflection in the white face that glues something like this. And this will give you a fundamental domain for this particular torus. And uh, the observation is because everything here is right angled, then the cusps are right angled. They're obtained by gluing together rectangles. And you can see this in SnapP. So I plugged in SnapP and I asked to look at the cusp geometry. Um, I think this is actually the geometry of a different cusp, uh, but you can see that it is in, it is still right angled. So this pink rectangle tells you the fundamental domain, and you can see the right angles there. Okay. Okay. So quick application before I move to my second talk. The way that these come up in uh, when you're looking at hyperbolic knots is you can apply them to what are called highly twisted knots. So if you do a Dane filling, so a Dane filling means you glue a solid torus to a torus boundary component. And in particular, we're going to do a one on end Dane filling of these unknots. This is a very special type of Dane filling in this setting. What it does is it puts in two end crossings and removes the crossing circles. So you can take all of your knot strands and you can turn them into something highly twisted. You may or may not have a knot when you are done. If you want one component, then you can also put in half twists 
the half twists are done geometrically. You just change the gluing on the crossing circles. So rather than gluing straight across, you just flip them over. This is still an isometry of a, of a twice punctured disc. And so that will give you um, single crossings. So in this way, you can add either even or odd numbers of crossings, right? So one crossing here to obtain um, a, a knot with a high number of crossings. And then this is quite geometric. So there are a few, there are sequences of theorems over the years that prove that the geometry does not change very much when you do a high Dane filling. So I'll uh, maybe just state this very briefly. Uh, but, but so then the corollary is that if you take a fully augmented link and you put in a high number of crossings, then you can say, you can obtain bounds on the geometric properties basically by starting with the circle packing, which is totally explicit, computing its geometry, and then applying these um, bounds on geometry. Okay. All right, so that's the end of my first talk, this introduction to fully augmented links. So let me pause for a second and see if there are questions. Could you go back to your previous slide? It went by so fast, I couldn't. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't really want to, to dwell on this in the interest of time, but um, Thurston was the first one who proved that as you have slope lengths going to infinity, then the geometry of the Dane filling will converge. And uh, I will come back to this actually in a minute, but then there are variations on this as well. So there's a, a more concrete, explicit results. If you have the length of the slope is at least six, then you get a hyperbolic Dane filling. If the length is at least two pi, then you get bounds on the volume. Um, if your normalized length, so this is slightly different, Hodgson Kirchhoff do, uh, the, their, the program of Hodgson Kirchhoff is to form through other metrics. And um, uh, Dave Feuder and Saul Schleimer and I, we extended this a, a couple of years ago just to get explicit bounds on the change in the, in the geometry. So I'll probably say more about that in a later talk too. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, if not, let me carry on. So I wanna generalize this. Um, this is joint work with um, Urs Fuchs and, and John Stewart. So in part one, we learned about fully augmented links, that they are these highly geometric things. They're constructed from a circle packing with a dimer and they all lie on the two sphere in the three sphere. And in this part, we are going to look at fully augmented links on higher genus surfaces in, in different compact three manifolds. So this is analogous to what we did yesterday for alternating links is that we put them onto different surf projection surfaces. So it's easy to define this. Um, <clears throat> if you, uh, you start with M, any three manifold and S an embedded surface, then to define a, a fully augmented link on a surface, you want your link to consist of two types of components. So again, you're going to have uh, knot strands. So these are these K1 through Kn that lie on the projection surface now. And you're gonna have um, crossing circles are still gonna be these things that, that bounded a twice punctured disc. And you should make sure that your diagram is connected. I should say, I, this was true of the last one. I didn't actually explicitly say that. Somebody should have called me on that, but we want a connected diagram. So uh, I've got a couple of examples. This one was created by um, John Stewart using the program Blender. And it shows a fully augmented link on a genus two surface. So when he created it, it was, it's a 3D model. You can rotate it around, but I just took a screenshot. So I can't, I'm not gonna rotate it for you. But anyway, you can see it's, it gets quite complicated. And then I wanted to uh, throw this into Snappy and ask what the hyperbolic geometry of it looked like. And so this is my attempt over here of um, redoing uh, John's diagram in, in SnapP. But again, this is gonna be a fully augmented link on a genus two surface. You could kind of see that here and here. So here's, this is what the surface looks like. And I've got, um, there are three crossing circles going over these, these uh, this, this middle section here, three going over this one, uh, four going up the middle and so on. Okay, so anyway, so this, this is an example. These are a little bit more complicated, as you can see. This is harder to draw, but they, but locally it's, it's pretty straightforward. Just these links on the projection surface and then crossing circles. Okay. All right, we can do the same decomposition that we did before. 
So we can cut along the projection surface. This is, there's the cut. Step one, we've got um, two pieces. They, I guess it depends. One of them is gonna be on one side of the projection surface. One of them is gonna be on the other side. Uh, uh, but then again, on each side, we can slice open these two punctured disks and flatten them like, like shown here. This is step two. Uh, and then shrink the remnants of the ideal vertices or, or the link to ideal vertices. And uh, I didn't draw it, but we can construct a nerve of a potential circle packing. And so this is going to be a triangulation of this projection surface. OK. So just as before, in fact, this Kobe-Andre of Thurston theorem can be extended to um, circle packings on higher genus, genus surfaces. So uh, the theorem is the generalized circle packing theorem. If you have a graph that's embedded on a surface, then there is going to be some constant curvature Riemannian metric that uh, a metric on, on your surface and a circle packing. So with respect to this metric, you need a metric to build circles. And this the contact graph is going to be isomorphic to your original graph G. In the case that we are looking at, where S is closed and G is a triangulation, so a closed surface and a triangulation, then in fact, this is unique up to isometry. Okay. So I was working on this with, uh, with John Stewart, and John and I were really excited. And we thought, all right, well, does this mean that we get these generalized fully augmented links on a surface? Do these have the same geometric properties of the usual ones? So, right, we, we have this construction. Let me go backwards. We have this construction. We get this circle packing that should correspond to the, um, the, the white faces. And the circle packing, there's a unique Riemannian metric with the circle packing. And so, in theory, we should be able to glue these things together. Uh, in fact, so remember this, this thing that I gave to SnapP. Uh, SnapP gave me back a, uh, a picture where the fundamental regions of the cusps looks like this. So observe that they are not right angled. Uh, it's kind of hard to see with my choice of color here. Maybe I should switch again. Um, if everything were, had worked perfectly, then this fundamental region would, be, uh, would have right angles. So something has gone wrong. So this gluing didn't work. Not everything is totally geodesic. Not everything is fitting together the way that it was expected. Okay, why? What's going on? Uh, the circle packings don't actually match is what's going on. So in this example here above, we've got this link in S3 uh, where the fully augmented link is sitting on a handle body, uh, a standard genus two surface. And we're gluing half. Of, we're gluing the handle body to another handle body to get S three. Okay, so we're gluing this marked handle body to a different marked handle body, and the circle packing theorem says that the boundary admits a metric with a unique circle packing, but unfortunately, this is not the metric that we get from the hyperbolic three manifold. So the marking is determining um, a, a conformal structure on the boundary. It, it will have a circle packing if you change the metric, but that's not necessarily going to be the one coming from the geometry, okay? All right, so I need to say something about, um, we're looking at manifolds now like this uh, Hagar, or the handle body. So it's uh, a handle body here has is this uh, genus two boundary. And these can often have geometry as well. So I was just saying something about um, conformal structures on the boundary of these things. If you have a, a hyperbolic three manifold whose boundary is bigger than a torus, then it's going to have infinite volume. Okay, so uh, if I've, I've written that here, if M is compact, but the genus of the boundary of that, that should be a boundary, is, is bigger than two, then you're going to get an infinite volume metric. So for example, uh, if you have a handle body, then again, you're still going to get the universal cover to be H3. But uh, in the case of a handle body, gamma is what is called a shot key group, and it glues um, circles to circles. So it, it takes like a circle here and will in invert in that. OK. And uh, in the hyperbolic three space, so think of this as being on the boundary at infinity, each of these you can think of as being hemispheres. So you're gluing geodesic planes to geodesic planes. That's all fine and good. Uh, 
when you're trying to measure the volume of this thing, then all of this region on the boundary of infinity is, is part of your manifold now, or, or the points that approach that are part of your manifold. And recall from the metric that if you have a couple of points that are getting closer and closer to that boundary, the distance between them is getting huge. And similarly, if you have a little square here, uh, that it's going to have area that's proportional to one over the height. And so the, the, the volume here is, is just getting huge and it's blowing up and it's going to infinity. Okay. Okay, so we need to go back to circle packings. Uh, we had a circle packing theorem here that says there is a circle, there is a Riemannian metric and a circle packing on that. We want a circle packing on a uh, particular hyperbolic structure, and we get that. So this is uh, joint work with um, Urs Fuchs. We brought him in. He's kind of an expert on the, some of the type Muller theory we needed. And myself and John Stewart uh, was hoping to get a preprint by today, but it's not quite ready. But, but basically what it says is that if you have a compact oriental three manifold uh, with interior has being a complete hyperbolic structure of infinite volume, and you have a nerve on your boundary, of a, uh, so some sort of a triangulation that's going to correspond to a circle packing, then in fact there is a unique hyperbolic structure with the same marking and it admits a circle packing with nerve G. Okay, so you still get a circle packing. So that is really good news. Unfortunately though, we still have this example where we couldn't glue the circles together. So why? It's because the packing is going to depend on the topology. So the, uh, in our particular case, we're looking at handle bodies uh, they have the same topology, but it also depends on the marking. So when you change, when you send a homeomorphism of the uh, boundary of the handle body to, to uh, the boundary and you change the marking, you're going to change the circle packing. Okay. So just again, just because two boundaries of, of man of three manifolds agree and you have the same graph on both, it doesn't mean you're going to get isometric circle packings. And that's what's happening in our example. Well, all right, but we wanted to build, I promised you fully augmented links generalized, and I've just shown you that your initial intuition is not going to work. Uh, we've got to do something to make the match. And what we do is exactly what we did in the case of the, um, the links on, on, uh, on, in, in the three sphere, which is you reflect. So remember when we had a fully augmented link, uh, I guess the picture that I drew looked uh, something like, well, I don't remember, something like this. We had this fully augmented link um, in, the, uh, in the three sphere. We had a reflection. So let's bring that back. So now if M is a three manifold with boundary, then the double of M is the manifold obtained by basically by reflecting. You take two copies of M, M, M0, M1, and then you glue them together on the, their boundaries. All right, so once you have that, now your circle packings are gonna glue isometrically just by this same reflection. And so you're gonna get these geometric fully augmented links now on a higher genus surface. Uh, so the, uh, the theorem, if you have a fully augmented link on a surface in a double DN, then L is obtained by a circle packing uh, by gluing back, uh, you, you glue uh, the black faces. So these, sorry, these are the bow ties. These are the triangles. So glue these across a dimer and you glue the white faces by reflection and you get uh, completely geometric things. Okay, so just as before, you can turn these into knots. You can add half twists. Uh, you get rectangular cusps, you can do uh, Dane fillings, and you can put in as many crossings as you want, and that's going to give you knots. And again, you have those four theorems that I showed you about Dane filling that will give you um, the geometry or geometric results as you do these, as you put in these crossings. And what this is going to imply is that these highly twisted links have bounded geometric um, properties. So proof is whatever geometric property you are after, you can, you can try one of these uh, four theorems, for example. Okay, I think that's the end of this talk. Oh, no, no, not quite. Ah, oh, yes. I, I, some observations, okay? 
Um, if M has more than one boundary, so I we were looking at these handle bodies. You can double along a handle body and get a geometric fully augmented link in the double of a handle body. But if you take something for uh, with two boundary components, so say a surface cross an interval, which we schematically draw like so, right, S cross I, then you can put your link here and you can double across this and get another copy of this thing over here. And this will give you a, um, a fully augmented link in uh, that lies in, in a neighborhood of this of S cross zero inside of S cross negative one one. So you, you can talk about uh, virtual knots now. These are knots that live on a projection surface and a thickened surface, okay. But then one other observation, so I think, okay, I should say, I think if this is a positive observation, look at this cool thing we can do with virtual knots, a, a somewhat negative observation. The double is never the three sphere. So we can never, ever, ever construct classical knots using this method unless we stick with the regular projection plane, the two sphere inside of the three sphere, okay. Um, so can we get the three sphere is basically an open question. And we thought about this a lot, but we didn't get anywhere with it at this point. So maybe you, someone out there can help me with this. Um, if F is a homeomorphism uh, between the boundary of two manifolds, then you can glue the, uh, the associated manifolds by um, via F. And there are lots and lots and lots of ways to do this with lots of different manifolds to actually get a three sphere. But then the question is, are, is there, can you pick M and N and a homeomorphism F um, for which these circle packings on the boundaries are going to be, can you guarantee that they are isometric uh, and you also end up with this three sphere? Okay, so that's pretty widely open. All right, and that is the end of that talk. So let me pause here for a second and see if people have questions. Yeah, I have a question. Hey, Jessica. Yeah. Yes. Um, my question is, do you think that this open problem is true? Or <laughs> I don't know. I actually have no good intuition about this at all. Uh, I guess I would have made it a conjecture if I thought it was true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know how to disprove it either. I just know how to prove that the double is not the three sphere. Um, yeah, that's a good question. All right, if there are no other questions, then maybe I will move on to the last part of the talk on geometric convergence. Okay, so now we're gonna get, we have to make some, um, a little bit more technical definitions. Uh, and this again, this is joint with, um, with Urs Fuchs and John Stewart, and then possibly parts with um, Dave Feuder and Saul Schleimer. So we built these fully augmented links on the uh, boundary of M and the double of M. And the reason why we built them, so John and I and, and Urs, when we brought him in, we're interested in the geometric convergence of knots. And so this is a project that we were able to do without knowing, without being able to build knots in the three sphere. But I need to tell you, we're going to be talking about limits of geometric spaces. And um, as a topologist, the first time I encountered the idea of spaces converging, that seemed kind of weird. Uh, there are some technical ways to define um, spaces converging. Um, intuitively, what you're doing is you get better and better, so better and better almost isometries on larger and larger compact sets. I'll explain that in a second, what, what that means. But, but really, the idea is you've got these big infinite volume things, possibly, or, or, or finite volume, but open, non-compact. Uh, and you want to compare them. So you'll have some sort of a map between them that the map is typically on a compact set, often a ball. Okay, and so it's going to take one ball to another. 
And it's not going to be quite the same ball, but it's, it's going to be a little bit wiggly, but only a little bit wiggly. So it's not quite an isometry, but it's going to be almost an isometry. Uh, and it's going to be almost an isometry. And you can make the isometry. This is going to depend on some epsilon. You can make that as, as, as good as you'd like just by taking epsilon to get smaller and smaller. And then you can also take your compact set to get larger and larger. And so this is going to be regulated by some sort of a radius r, where r, r is now going to be going to um, infinity. OK. And if you have this, this picture, then we say that these spaces converge geometrically. OK, so here's a more technical definition. Uh, epsilon r close hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, for hyperbolic space, we're going to fix a ball at, uh, in, in hyperbolic three space at, at our favorite choice of origin. We can pick anything. They're all isometric. And then we actually fix a frame as well. And so once we picked uh, a, basically an, a ball and an orientation, then any hyperbolic three manifold, you can conjugate it to have a, a fixed, its fixed base point lying, um, mapping to that base point and that orientation. And so this is a way of kind of, of, of conjugating things so that you can compare them correctly. So once you are able to compare them, then you say that two manifolds are epsilon r close if you have this almost isometry. So one plus epsilon by Lipschitz embedding uh, on, on the universal cover really on the balls so that this is um, very, the, the distance between this and the identity is, is small in C0 topology. And also the F descends to an embedding in your manifolds. So this is where you've got these almost isometries on the balls in bigger and bigger balls. Okay. So we say that these converge geometrically. Uh, if for any epsilon and R, you can find um, a, 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 an integer so that for k in a sequence larger than, than this integer, you're always going to have every, every um, manifold in your sequence is epsilon r close to mp. And mp is said to be a geometric limit. And this is, this is basically the picture that I drew before. So uh, let me just even say that one more time. So roughly, what's happening is you're getting better and better almost isometries controlled by epsilon on bigger and bigger compact sets, which are controlled by r. OK, that's geometric convergence. An example of geometric convergence that happens in finite volume manifolds is Dane filling. So I'll show you how this works on the next slide, but just to get us on the same, the same page, um, I've, I've actually already mentioned this, but the topological Dane filling is where you take a manifold with a torus boundary and a simple closed curve on that boundary. So I've, I've got S highlighted here as a simple closed curve on my schematic three manifold M. Uh, and, and you glue a solid torus so that S bounds a disk. So this changes the topology of the manifold. Uh, Bill Thurston was the first to see that you can do this geometrically. So if you start with a complete uh, hyperbolic metric, then you will be in this a picture that is here, complete, say. So for example, you could take this to be built from ideal tetrahedra. So in his, his notes from the late 1970s, he does this for the figure eight not complement explicitly. Uh, but in, in general, if you have a manifold with torus boundary component, then your, uh, your torus is going to have some sort of a fundamental domain on horospheres. And this would be a copy. You'd have a bit of manifold down here doing whatever it does. But up on a horosphere, you would see a fundamental domain for the torus and it would be a rectangle or a parallelogram, I should say more generally. And it would tile the whole plane by parallelograms and you get this nice complete structure. So Thurston noticed that if you take this structure and you just tweak it a little tiny bit, so you take these tetrahedra and you just change them a very, very small amount, what happens is you get an incomplete metric. And on your horosphere, what that corresponds to is you've only changed things slightly, but this parallelogram now becomes some sort of a quadrilateral that doesn't tile the, the plane anymore. It doesn't tile the horosphere. And you're going to get these fundamental regions that are going to be spiraling around and avoiding a particular point there in the middle. So okay, actually, I got to change my pen color again. Um, let's go back to red. OK, so it's, it's missing this point in the middle. So uh, you're, you're getting something incomplete. If you were to complete it, 
then you'd be taking all of these points. There's, it, uh, if you take this, this missed point across an interval, you actually get a whole real line here. And when you take the completion, you're going to be adding that line into your space and then quotienting out by your group. And generically, what you get is a one-point compactification. You get this thing that's a mess that's not a manifold. Uh, on a so this this is generically meaning um, uh, uncountably many times that you do this, you're going to get this one-point compactification. But you might be lucky. There's going to be a discrete set of points for which you actually do get a manifold. And when you do get a manifold, what's happening is you're taking this torus boundary and you're adding in a neighborhood of this geodesic. So it looks something like this in the hyperbolic space. This is a neighborhood of the geodesic. Um, and topologically, the quotient here is going to be a solid torus. And so topologically, this completion is giving you a Dane filling, but it's a geometric Dane filling. So this is called hyperbolic Dane surgery. And when you do very, very small deformations, these correspond to um, very long slope of your Dane surgery. And this is Thurston's, this is basically what he showed for his, uh, there's an R in there, Thurston's uh, hyperbolic Dane surgery theorem that I mentioned earlier and glossed over. But it's that the geometry changes for high slopes, and he didn't say how high, but the geometry changes only very slightly. Okay. Um, if the geometry changes only very slightly, recall we're talking about geometric convergence. We, it means that in compact sets, so if you have a little a ball that fits inside a fundamental domain here, it'll fit inside a fundamental domain here. When you do the change from here to here, you're not going to see very much happening. So it's an almost isometry. And then you can expand these balls and make them larger and larger, and you get better and better almost isometries. This is a geometric convergence. All right. So using this very geometric picture, you can say all sorts of things about topological um, uh, topological phenomena on, on knots. Um, Dane filling. I, I mentioned that if you do a one on n Dane filling, you put two you put in two n crossings in your manifold. So this will imply that you get geometric limits of knot complements. And again, this is in Thurston's notes. So one of a, a very cool thing: twist knot complements converge geometrically to the whitehead link. So you're putting in more and more crossings into this twist region, and in the limit, you are getting this new cusp developing, okay? More generally, these highly twisted knots that we were talking about in talk one, these converge geometrically to a fully augmented link. Um, and actually this happens both in the three sphere, this is talk one, and on um, the boundary of M in, in the double, that was, that was part two of today's talk. And you can see this by snap P. So I've just shown for you, um, I, I've drawn some uh, twist knots and the whitehead link. So over here on the right, we've got the whitehead link. These, uh, this, this blue sphere is what is the, what's going to be the new crossing circle cusp. Uh, I've made it as small as I could so that you could see the mo most detail. Uh, if, if you could take it off, you could see a little bit better. But when you've got only six crossings, you can see there's this big, there are a couple of big horos, horror balls that are corresponding to these big ones over here. And then in the middle, there's still some stuff going on. But as you increase the crossings um, in this picture, the, the, the middle, the spheres are getting smaller and smaller. Here, they're actually splitting off and you're getting this empty hole. As you go to higher and higher crossings, it becomes more and more round until it, until it looks pretty much identical to the whitehead link. So you, you see that, that's kind of nice. Uh, back in 2010, uh, I proved a, a result with Juan Soto that says that any complete hyperbolic manifold with finitely generated fundamental group and a single topological end, which embeds in the three sphere, uh, we showed that this is a geometric limit of a sequence of hyperbolic knot complements in the three sphere. So, let me, uh, all of this uh, hyperbolic, we're, we're typically looking here at an infinite volume, uh, complicated uh, hyperbolic three manifold. So there's been a lot of work recently in infinite volume hyperbolic three manifolds. I'm gonna talk about that more tomorrow. But um, what this theorem says is all of this complicated stuff that happens in the infinite volume case, 
you can approximate by a sequence of knot complements. So if you weren't convinced that you needed to be a hyperbolic knot theorist before, then this slide ought to convince you, right? Uh, hyper, the hyperbolic knot theory, it approximates all sorts of um, complicated geometry. Uh, an issue with this theorem though, so even though it's, uh, I, I quite like it, the proof is totally non-constructive. We have absolutely no idea what uh, a sequence of knots should look like. We just know that there is one. So we built it by all of these abstract existence tools. So when I started on this problem that ended up in fully augmented links, what I did is I, I took this problem to um, John Stewart and asked, so together, can we figure out what a converging sequence of knots would look like? Uh, so this is a paper that's on the archive. Uh, if M is a geometrically finite hyperbolic three manifold, I'll, I'll say what this means a little bit later, but basically, well, I'll say what it means now. Geometrically finite, it means it has a finite sided fundamental domain. So actually geometrically finite ones are, are nice hyperbolic structures, but you've got an infinite volume, geometrically finite manifold, then, um, oh, and also homeomorphic to the interior of a compact manifold with one boundary component. So then you need one boundary component to build a knot. There's a sequence of highly twisted knots on the boundary in the double so that the knots converge geometrically to M and this proof is constructive. And what do we construct? We construct fully augmented links. And I should say too, so this is not as nice as my paper with Juan because we stick to geometrically finite ones. On the other hand, we'll see, I'll say more about this tomorrow, geometrically finite ones converge to all the other ones as well. That's the density theorem. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> um, sorry, I just said I was worried a fire alarm might be going off. It looks like we're okay. <laughs> Um, also, uh, we, we're not in the three sphere anymore. So we're looking at knots on the boundary in a double, but they do converge geometrically. So in the few minutes that uh, I have left, I'm gonna, let's, we're gonna walk through this proof and it comes back to a theorem of Brooks where we look at um, circle packed manifolds. So in 1986, uh, Brooks showed that if you have a geometrically finite hyperbolic three manifold, then you could approximate this by a uh, geometrically finite hyperbolic three manifold again with um, a circle packing on its conformal boundary. And the proof actually constructs a circle packing. So let me just show you some, some slides in this. So you start by, uh, you wanna construct a circle packing. And so what do you do? start putting circles in. So we've got a geometrically finite fundamental domain. So there are gonna be some, some uh, that means uh, you're gonna be gluing some bits of the circle to, to other bits of the circle. And when you put, you can put some circles on the edges, you just need to make sure that they glue appropriately and, and you can do that. And then once you've done that, you just start filling in circles like so, da -da -da, put them in and you can pack them in uh, as tightly as you can until you are eventually left with only triangles and, and quads, um, I, I should say, as the interstitial regions. So up here, I've shown a, this is a quadrilateral interstitial region. And um, well, a triangular one is where you would have three tangent together. And what Brooks noticed is you can start packing in uh, circles into these triangular regions, or sorry, these quadrilateral regions, and they'll follow kind of a pattern in the fairy graph. So first you will pack to the left, to the left, and then you will pack to the, uh, to the right, to the top, and to the right again, and then to the left, and, and so on. You get this sequence of L's and R's that give you a point in the fairy graph, which corresponds to a continued fraction, which corresponds to a rational point. So what did he show? Uh, these quads have a deformation space that's homeomorphic to R and the rationals correspond exactly to the circle packings. So once you have a quad that's small enough, you just bump the circle a little tiny bit and you get a circle packing with triangular interstitial regions. Okay, once we've got a circle packing, we pick a dimer. Uh, so we'll have a nerve of a circle packing like so. And picking a dimer is, is easy. What you do is you just add a new circle to the interstitial regions. And what that's gonna do is it's going to subdivide each of these triangles. So recall a dimer, you want one edge per circle, per triangle, I mean. 
and observe that the solid red lines that came from my original triangles now give me a dimer. So all I have to do is add these extra circles. Okay, I've got a triangulation, I've got a dimer. I can build a fully augmented link. So you glue into a fully augmented link on the boundary of N, and then you put it inside the double. And this is going to be your geometric link that is going to be, on the one hand, the circle packed thing is converging to the one to the guy that you're looking for. Um, you, now you double that, you've still got, you've got a ball over here that has the correct uh, geometry and you don't even care what's, what's over here. Uh, you can do whatever you want, but now we've got this explicit link. And then you can turn it into a knot by putting in as many crossings as you want. And, uh, and that will give you the result. Okay, so let me end with some open questions. So unfortunately, there's still no construction with knots in the three sphere. So this would be fun if you could figure out how to do that. Uh, again, as I said, it's easy to find manifold, manifolds so that the gluing of these two manifolds is a three sphere. But again, the circles from Brooks theorem aren't necessarily going to be glued by an isometry. But then again, on the other hand, this is not as um, rigid as talk two. So in talk two, we were trying to construct these explicit link. In here, we're just trying to approximate. So even if we can never show that they're glued, these things are glued by an isometry, maybe what we can do is we can show that this um, topological gluing, as you get more and more circles, possibly the topology is going to be approximating the geometry in that case. Even if you're not getting these right angle things, maybe these slightly diagonal things will be approximating appropriately and that would be enough. But um, again, I, I'm not quite sure how to do that. So I'll leave that as open. All right, so I will stop there. Thank you very much. Let's thank Jessica for her second talk. Okay, and I guess we should uh, then transition right into the discussion session, uh, discussion slash question session. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please go ahead. Uh, I'll stop the recording.